Separating from Human Nature in Its Fourfold State by Thomas Boston of Hell. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. Were there no other place of eternal lodging but heaven? I should here have closed my discourse of man's eternal state. But as in the other world there is a prison for the wicked, as well as a palace for the saints, we must also inquire into that state of everlasting misery which the worst of men may well bear with, without crying, Art thou come to torment us before the time? Since there is yet access to flee from the wrath to come, and all that can be said of it comes short of what the damned will feel, for who knoweth the power of God's anger? The last thing which our Lord did before he left the earth was, he lifted up his hands and blessed his disciples, Luke twenty four fifty and 51. But the last thing he will do before he leaves the throne is to curse and condemn his enemies. As we learn from the text, which contains a dreadful sentence, wherein the everlasting misery of the wicked is declared, in which three things may be taken notice of. Number one, the quality of the condemned. He cursed. The judge finds the curse of the law upon them as transgressors and sends them away with it from his presence into hell, there to be fully executed upon them. Number two, the punishment which they are adjudged to and to which they were always bound over by virtue of the curse. And it is twofold, the punishment of loss and separation from God and Christ. Depart from me and the punishment of sense and most exquisite and extreme torments. Depart from me into fire. Number three, the aggravations of their torments. They are ready for them. They are not to expect a moment's respite. The fire is prepared and ready to catch hold of those who are thrown into it. Number two, they will have the society of devils in their torments being shut up with them in hell. They must depart into the same fire prepared for Beelzebub, the prince of devils, and his angels, namely other reprobate angels who fell with him and became devils. It is said to be prepared for them because they sinned and were condemned to hell before a man sinned. This speaks further terror to the damned that they must go into the same torments and place of torment with the devil and his angels. They hearken to his temptations and they must partake in his torments. His works they would do and they must receive the wages, which is death. In this life they joined with devils in enmity against God and Christ and the way of holiness. And in the other they must lodge with them. Thus all the goats shall be shut up together, for that name is common to devils and wicked men in Scripture. Leviticus 17, verse 7, where the word rendered devils properly signifies hairy ones or goats in the shape of which creatures devils delighted much to appear to their worshippers. Number three, the last aggravation of their torment is the eternal duration of it. They must depart into everlasting fire. This is what puts the top stone upon their misery, namely that it shall never have an end. Doctrine. The wicked shall be shut up under the curse of God in everlasting misery with the devils in hell. After having proved that there shall be a resurrection of the body and a general judgment, I think it not needful to insist on proving the truth of future punishment. The same conscience there is in men of a future judgment bears witness also of the truth of future punishment, and that the punishment of the damned shall not be annihilation, or a reducing them to nothing will be clear in the progress of our discourse. In treating of this awful subject, I shall inquire into these four things. First, the curse under which the damned shall be shut up. Secondly, their misery under that curse. Number three, their society with devils in this miserable state. Number four, the eternity of the whole. First, as to the curse under which the damned shall be shut up in hell, 
It is a terrible sentence of the law, by which they are bound over to the wrath of God as transgressors. This curse does not first seize them when standing before the tribunal to receive their sentence, but they were born under it. They led their lives under it in this world. They died under it, rose with it out of their graves, and the judge finding it upon them, sends them away with it into the pit, where it shall lie on them through all the ages of eternity. By nature all men are under the curse, but it is removed from the elect by virtue of their union with Christ. It abides on the rest of sinful mankind, and by it they are devoted to destruction, separated to evil. As one describes the curse from Deuteronomy 29, verse 21. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil. Thus shall the damned forever be persons devoted to destruction, separate and set apart from the rest of mankind, unto evil, as vessels of wrath, set up as marks for the arrows of divine wrath, and made the common receptacle and shore of vengeance. This curse has its first fruits on earth, which are a pledge of the whole lump that is to follow. Hence it is that as temporal and eternal benefits are bound up together under the same expressions and the promise to the Lord's people, as Isaiah 35.10, and the ransom of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion, and so on, relating both to return from Babylon and to the saints, going to the eternal rest in heaven. Even so, temporal and eternal miseries on the enemies of God are sometimes included under one and the same expression in the threatening, as Isaiah 30, verse 33, For Tophet is ordained of old, Yea, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. The pile hereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. Which relates both to the temporal and eternal destruction of the Assyrians, who fell by the hand of the angel before Jerusalem. See also Isaiah 66:24. What is that judicial blindness to which many are given up, whom the God of this world has blinded? Second Corinthians 4:4. 4, 4. But the first fruits of hell and of the curse. Their sun is going down at noonday, their darkness increasing, as if it would not stop till it issue in utter darkness. Many a lash in the dark doth conscience give the wicked, which the world doth not hear of. And what is that but the never dying worm already begun to gnaw them? And there is not one of these, but they may call it Joseph, for the Lord shall add another, or rather Gad, for a troop cometh. These drops of wrath are terrible forebodings of the full shower which is to follow. Sometimes they are given up to their vile affections that they have no more command over them. Romans 1 verse 26 So their lusts grow up more and more towards perfection, if I may so speak. As in heaven grace comes to us perfection, so in hell sins arrives at its highest pitch, and as sin is thus advancing upon a man, he is the nearer and liker to hell. There are three things that have a fearful aspect here. Number one, when everything that might do good to men's souls is blasted to them, so that their blessings are cursed. Malachi 2.2 2. Sermons, prayers, admonitions, and reproofs which are powerful towards others are quite inefficacious to them. Number two, when men go on sinning still in the face of plain rebukes from the Lord and ordinances and providences, God meets them with rods in the way of their sin as if it were striking them back. Yet they rush forward. What can be more like hell where the Lord is always smiting and the damned always sinning against him? Number three, when everything in one's lot is turned into fuel to one's lusts, thus adversity and prosperity, poverty and wealth, the want of ordinances and the enjoyment of them do all but nourish the corruptions of many. Their vicious stomachs corrupt whatever they receive and all does but increase noxious humors. 
But the full harvest follows in that misery which they shall forever lie under in hell. That wrath which, by virtue of the curse, shall come upon them to the uttermost, which is a curse fully executed. This black cloud opens upon them, and a terrible thunderbolt strikes them by that dreadful voice from the throne, Depart from me, cursed, and so on, which will give the whole wicked world a dismal view of what is in the bosom of the curse. It is, number one, a voice of extreme indignation and wrath, a furious rebuke from the lion of the tribe of Judah. His looks will be most terrible to them. His eyes will cast flames of fire on them, and his words will pierce their hearts like envenomed arrows. When he will thus speak them out of his presence forever, and by his word chase them away from before the throne, they will see how keenly wrath burns in his heart against them for their sins. Number two, it is a voice of extreme disdain and contempt from the Lord. Time was when they were pitied, admonished to pity themselves and to be the Lord's. Yet they despised him, they would none of him. But now they shall be buried out of his sight under everlasting contempt. Number three, it is a voice of extreme hatred. Hereby the Lord shuts them out of his bowels of love and mercy. Depart, ye cursed. I cannot endure to look at you. There is not one purpose of good to you in mine heart. Nor shall you ever hear one word more of hope from me. Number four. It is a voice of eternal rejection from the Lord. He commands them to be gone and so casts them off forever. Thus the doors of heaven are shut against them. The gulf is fixed between them and it, and they are driven to the pit. Now were they to cry with all possible earnestness, Lord, Lord, open to us. They will hear nothing but depart, depart, ye cursed. The shell the dam be shut up under the curse. Application number one. Let all those who be in yet in their natural state or under the curse consider this. And flee to Jesus Christ in time that they may be delivered from it. How can you sleep in that state being under the curse? Jesus Christ is now saying unto you, Come ye cursed, I will take the curse from off you and give you the blessing. The waters of the sanctuary are now running to heal the cursed ground. Take heed to improve them for that end to your own souls and fear it as hell to get no spiritual advantage by it. Remember that the miry places which are neither sea nor dry land, a fit emblem of hypocrites in the marshes, that neither breed fishes nor bear trees, but the waters of the sanctuary leave them as they find them in their barrenness, shall not be healed, seeing they spurn the only remedy. They shall be given to salt, left under eternal barrenness, set up for the monuments of the wrath of God included forever under the curse, Ezekiel 47.11, number 2. Let all cursers consider this, whose mouths are filled with cursing themselves and others. He who clothes himself with cursing shall find a curse come into his bowels like water and oil into his bones. Psalm 109.18 if repentance prevent it not, he shall get all his imprecations against himself fully answered in the day in which he stands before the tribunal of God, and shall find the killing weight of the curse of God which he now makes light of. Secondly, I proceed to speak of the misery of the damned under that curse, a misery which the tongues of men and angels cannot sufficiently express. God always acts like himself. No favors can be compared to his, and his wrath and terrors are without a parallel. As the saints in heaven are advanced to the highest pitch of happiness, so the damned in hell arrive at the height of misery. Two things here I shall soberly inquire into, the punishment of loss and the punishment of sense in hell. But since these also are such things as I hath not seen nor ear heard, we must, as geographers do, leave a large void for the unknown land which the day will discover. 
Number one, the punishment of loss which the damned shall undergo is separation from the Lord as we learn from the text. Depart from me, ye cursed. This will be a stone upon their grave's mouth. It's a talent of lead. Zechariah 5, verses 7 and 8. That will hold them down forever. They shall be eternally separated from God and Christ. Christ is the way to the Father, but the way is to them shall be everlastingly blocked up. The bridge shall be drawn and the great gulf fixed. So they shall be shut up in a state of eternal separation from God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They will be locally separated from the man Christ and shall never come into the seat of the blessed, where he appears in his glory, but be cast out into utter darkness. Matthew 22, verse 13. They cannot indeed be locally separated from God. They cannot be in a place where he is not, since he is and will be present everywhere. If I make my bed in hell, saith the psalmist, Behold, thou art there. Psalm 139, verse 8. But they shall be miserable beyond expression in a relative separation from God. Though he will be present in the very center of their souls, if I may so express it, while they are wrapped up in fiery flames and utter darkness, it shall only be to feed them with the vinegar of his wrath and to punish them with the emanations of his revenging justice. They shall never more taste of his goodness and bounty, nor have the least glimpse of hope from him. They will see his heart to be absolutely alienated from them, and that it cannot be towards them, that they are the party against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. They shall be deprived of the glorious presence and enjoyment of God. They shall have no part in the beatific vision nor see anything in God towards them but one wave of wrath rolling upon another. This will bring upon them overwhelming floods of sorrow forevermore. They shall never taste of the rivers of pleasures which the saints in heaven enjoy, but they shall have an everlasting winter and a perpetual night because the Son of Righteousness has departed from them, and so they are left in utter darkness. So great as heaven's happiness is, so great will their loss be, for they can have none of it forever. The separation of the wicked from God will be number one, an involuntary separation. Now they depart from him, they will not come to him, though they are called and entreated to come, but then they shall be driven away from him, when they would gladly abide with him. Although the question, what is thy beloved more than another, beloved, is frequent now amongst the despisers of the gospel, there will be no such question among all the damned, for then they will see that man's happiness is only to be found in the enjoyment of God, and that the loss of him is a loss that can be never balanced. Number two, it will be a total and utter separation Though the wicked are in this life separated from God, yet there is a kind of intercourse between them. He gives them many good gifts, and they give him at least some good words, so that the peace is not altogether hopeless. But then, there shall be a total separation, the damned being cast into utter darkness, where there will not be the least gleam of light and favor from the Lord, which will put an end unto all their fair words to him. Number three, there shall be a final separation. They will part with him, never more to meet, being shut up under everlasting horror and despair. The match between Jesus Christ and unbelievers, which has so often been carried forward and put back again, shall then be broken up forever. And never shall one message of favor or goodwill go between the parties any more. This punishment of loss and a total and final separation from God is a misery beyond what mortals can conceive and which the dreadful experience of the dam can only sufficiently unfold. But that we may have some conception of the horror of it, let these following things be considered. Number one, God is the chief good. Therefore, to be separated from him must be the chief evil. Our native country 
our relations and our life are good. Therefore, to be deprived of them, we reckon a great evil, and the better anything is, so much the greater evil is the loss of it. Therefore, God being the chief good and no good comparable to him, there can be no loss so great as the loss of God. The full enjoyment of him is the highest pinnacle of happiness a creature is capable of arriving at. To be fully and finally separated from him must then be the lowest step of misery which the rational creature can be reduced to. To be cast off by men by good men is distressing. What must it then be to be rejected of God of goodness itself? Number two. God is the fountain of all goodness from which all goodness flows to the creatures and by which it is continued in them and to them. Whatever goodness or perfection, natural as well as moral, is in any creature, it is from God and depends upon Him as the light is from and depends on the sun. For every created being as such is a dependent one. Therefore, a total separation from God in which all comfortable communication between God and a rational creature is absolutely blocked up must of necessity bring alone with it a total eclipse of all light of comfort and ease, whatever. If there is but one window or open place in a house, and that be quite shut up, it is evident there can be nothing but darkness in that house. Our Lord tells us, Matthew 19:17, There is none good but one, that is, God. Nothing good or comfortable is originally from the creature. Whatever good or comfortable thing one finds in oneself is health of body, peace of mind. Whatever sweetness, rest, pleasure, or delight, one finds in other creatures as in meat, drink, arts, and sciences. All these are but some faint rays of divine perfections communicated from God to the creature, and dependent on a constant influence from him for their conversation, which failing, they would immediately be gone. For it is impossible that any created thing can be to us more or better than what God makes it to be. All the rivulets of comfort we drink of, within or without ourselves, come from God as their springhead, the course of which toward us being stopped, of necessity they must all dry up, so that when God goes, all that is good and comfortable goes with him, all ease and quiet of body and mind, Hosea 9.12. Woe also to them when I depart from them, when the wicked are totally and finally separated from him. All that is comfortable in them or about them returns to its fountain. As the light goes away with the sun, a darkness succeeds in the room of it. Thus, in their separation from God, all peace is removed far away from them, and pain and body and anguish of soul succeed to it. All joy goes and unmixed sorrow settles in them. All quiet and rest separate from them and they are filled with horror and rage hope flies away and despair seizes them common operations of the spirit which now restrain them are withdrawn forever and sin comes to its utmost height thus we have a dismal view of the horrible spectacle of sin and misery which a creature proves when totally separated from God and left to itself and we may see the separation to be the very hell of hell being separated from God, they are deprived of all good. The good things which they set their hearts upon in this world are beyond their reach there. The covetous man cannot enjoy his wealth there, nor the ambitious man his honors, nor the sensual man his pleasures, no, not a drop of water to cool his tongue. Luke 16, verses 24 and 25. No meat or drink there to strengthen the faint, no sleep to refresh the weary, and no music or pleasant company to comfort and cheer up the sorrowful. And as for those good things they despise in the world, they shall never more hear of them nor see them. No offer of Christ there, no pardon, no peace, no wells of salvation in the pit of destruction. 
In one word, they shall be deprived of whatever might comfort them, being totally and finally separated from God, the fountain of all goodness and comfort. Number three, man naturally desires to be happy, being conscious to himself that he is not self-sufficient. He has ever the desire of something without himself to make him happy and the soul being by its natural make and constitution capable of enjoying God, and nothing else being commensurable to its desires. It can never have true and solid rest till it rests in the enjoyment of God. This desire of happiness, the rational creature can never lay aside, no, not in hell. Now while the wicked are on earth, they seek their satisfaction in the creature. And when one fails, they go to another. Thus they spend their time in the world, deceiving their own souls with vain hopes. But in the other world, a comfort in the creature's failing, and the shadows which you are now pursuing vanished in a moment they shall be totally and finally separated from God. And see, they have thus lost him. So the doors of earth and heaven both are shut against him at once. This will create them unspeakable anguish while they shall live under an eternal gnawing hunger after happiness, which they certainly know they shall never be in the least measure satisfied. All doors being closed on them, who then can imagine how the separation from God shall cut the damned to the heart? How will they roar and rage under it? And how will it sting and gnaw them through the ages of eternity? Number four. The damned shall know that some are perfectly happy in the enjoyment of that God from whom they themselves are separated. And this will aggravate the sense of their loss that they can never have any share with those happy ones. Being separated from God, they are separated from the society of the glorified saints and angels. They may see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, Luke 16, verse 23, but can never come into their company, being as unclean lepers thrust out without the camp, and excommunicated from the presence of the Lord and of all his holy ones. It is the opinion of some that every person in heaven or hell shall hear and see all that passes in either state, Whatever is to be said of this, we have ground from the word to conclude that the damned shall have a very exquisite knowledge of the happiness of the saints in heaven. For what else can be meant of the rich man in hell seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom? One thing is plain in this case, that their own torments will give them such notions of the happiness of the saints as a sick man has of health or a prisoner has of liberty. And if they cannot fail of reflecting on the happiness of those in heaven without any hope of attaining to contentment with their own lot, so every thought of that happiness will aggravate their loss. It would be a mighty torment to a hungry man to see others liberally feasting while he is so chained up. It's not to have one crumb to stay his gnawing appetite. To bring music and dancing before a man laboring under extreme pains would but increase his anguish. How then will the songs of the blessed in their enjoyment of God make the damned mourn under their separation from him? Number five. They will remember that time was when they might have been made partakers of the blessed company of saints in their enjoyment of God. And this will aggravate their sense of the loss. All may remember that there was once a possibility of it that they were once in the world in some corners of which the way of salvation was laid open to men's view, and may wish they had gone round the world till they had found it out. Despisers of the gospel will remember with bitterness that Jesus Christ with all his benefits was offered to them, that they were exhorted and treated and pressed to accept, but would not, and that they were warned of the misery they feel and exhorted to flee from the wrath to come but they would not hearken. The gospel offer slighted will make a hot hell, and the loss of an offered heaven will be a sinking weight on the spirits of unbelievers in the pit. Some will remember that there was a probability of their being eternally happy, that once they seemed to stand fair for it, and were not far from the kingdom of God, 
that they had once almost consented to the blessed bargain the pen was in their hand, as it were, to sign the marriage contract between Christ and their souls. But unhappily they dropped it and turned back from the Lord to their lusts again. Others will remember that they thought themselves sure of heaven. But being blinded with pride and self-conceit, they were above ordinances and beyond instruction and would not examine their state, which was their ruin. But then they will in vain wish that they had reputed themselves the worst of the congregation and curse the fond conceit they had of themselves and that others had of them too. Thus it will sting the damned that they might have escaped this loss. Number six. They will see the loss to be irrecoverable, that they must eternally lie under it. Never, never, to be repaired? Might the damned after millions of ages in hell regain what they have lost, it would be some ground of hope. But the prize is gone and never can be recovered. There are two things which will pierce them to the heart. Number one, that they never knew the worth of it till it was irrecoverably lost. Should a man give away an earthen pot full of gold for a trifle, not knowing what was in it till it were quite gone from him and past recovery, how would this foolish action gall him upon the discovery of the riches in it? Such in one's case may be a faint resemblance of the case of despisers of the gospel when in hell they lift up their eyes and behold that to their torment, which they will not see now to their salvation. Number two, that they have lost it for dross and dung, sold their part of heaven and not enriched themselves with the price. They have lost heaven for earthly profits and pleasures, and now both are gone together from them. The drunkard's cups are gone, the covetous man's gain, the voluptuous man's carnal delights, and the sluggard's ease. Nothing is left to comfort them now. The happiness they lost remains indeed, but they can have no part in it forever. Application Sinners, be persuaded to come to God through Jesus Christ uniting with him through the mediator, that you may be preserved from this fearful separation from him. Or be afraid to live in a state of separation from God, lest that which you now make your choice become your eternal punishment hereafter. Do not reject communion with God. Cast not off the communion of saints, for it will be the misery of the damned to be driven out from that communion. Cease to build up the wall of separation between God and you. By continuing in your sinful courses, repent rather in time, and so pull it down, lest the top stone be laid upon it, and it stand forever between you and happiness. Tremble at the thought of rejection and separation from God. By whomsoever men are rejected upon earth, they ordinarily find some pity, but if you be thus separated from God, you will find all doors shut against you. You will find no pity from any in heaven. Neither saints nor angels will pity them whom God has utterly cast off. None will pity you in hell, where there is no love but loathing. All being loathed of God, loathing him and loathing one another. This is a day of losses and fears. I show you a loss you would do well to fear in time. Be afraid lest you lose God. If you do, eternity will be spent in roaring out lamentations for this loss. or oh, horrid stupidity. Men are in a mighty care and concern to prevent worldly losses, but they are in danger of losing the enjoyment of God forever and ever. In danger of losing heaven, the communion of the blessed, and all good things for soul and body in another world, yet as careless in that manner as if they were incapable of thought. Well, compare to this day with the day our text aims at. Today heaven is open for those who hitherto have rejected Christ. And yet there is room if they will come. But that day the door shall be shut. Now Christ is saying unto you, Come. Then he will say, Depart, seeing you would not come when you were invited. Now pity is shown. The Lord pities you. His servants pity you. And tell you that the pit is before you and cry to you that you do yourselves no harm, but then shall you have no pity from God or man. 
Number two, the damned shall be punished in hell with the punishment of sense. They must depart from God into everlasting fire. I am not disposed to dispute what kind of fire it is into which they shall depart to be tormented forever. Whether a material fire or not, experience will more than satisfy the curiosity of those who are disposed rather to dispute about it than to seek how to escape it. Neither will I meddle with the question, where is it? It is enough that the worm that never dieth and the fire that is never quenched will be found somewhere by impenitent sinners. But first I shall prove that whatever kind of fire it is, it is more vehement and terrible than any fire we on earth are acquainted with. Secondly, I shall state some of the properties of these fiery torments. As to the first of these, burning is the most terrible punishment and brings the most exquisite pain and torment with it. By what reward can a man be induced to hold only his hand in a flame of a candle but for one hour? All imaginable pleasures on earth will never prevail with the most voluptuous man to venture to lodge but one half hour in a burning fiery furnace. Nor would all the wealth in the world prevail with the most covetous to do it. Yet on much lower terms do most men in effect expose themselves to everlasting fire in hell which is more vehement and terrible than any fire we on earth are acquainted with, as will appear by the following considerations. Number one. As in heaven grace being brought to its perfection, profit and pleasure also arrive at their height there. So sin being come to its height in hell, the evil of punishment also arrives at its perfection there. Therefore, as the joys of heaven are far greater than any joys which the saints obtain on earth, so the punishments of hell must be greater than any earthly torments whatever, not only in respect of the continuance of them, but also in respect of vehemency and exquisiteness. Number two, why are the things of another world represented to us in an earthly dress, in the word, but because of weakness of our capacities in such manners? which the Lord is pleased to condescend to, requires it. It being always supposed that the things of the other world are in their kind more perfect than those by which they are represented. When heaven is represented to us under the notion of a city, with gates of pearl and the streets of gold, we expect not to find gold and pearls there, which are so mightily prized on earth, but something more excellent than the finest and most precious things in the world. When therefore we hear of hell fire, it is necessary we understand by it something more vehement, piercing, and tormenting than any fire ever seen by our eyes. And here it is worth considering that the torments of hell are held forth under several other notions than that of fire simply. And the reason of it is plain, namely, that hereby what of horror is wanting in one notion of hell is supplies by another why is heaven's happiness represented under the various notions of a treasure, a paradise, a feast, a rest, and so on? But there is not one of these things sufficient to express it. Even so, hell torments are represented under the notion of fire which the damned are cast into. A dreadful representation indeed, yet not sufficient to express the misery of the state of sinners in them. Therefore we hear also of the second death, Revelation 20, verse 6. For the damned in hell shall be ever dying of the winepress of the wrath of God, Revelation 14, verse 9, wherein they will be trodden in anger, trampled in the Lord's fury, Isaiah 63, verse 3, pressed, broken and bruised, without end. The worm that dies not, Mark 9, 44. We shall eternally gnaw them a bottomless pit where there will be ever sinking. Revelation 20, verse 3. It is not simply called a fire, but the lake of fire and brimstone. Revelation 20, verse 10. A lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 19, 20. Then which one can imagine nothing more dreadful. Yet because fire gives light and light, as Solomon observes, Ecclesiastes 11, 7 is sweet. There is no light there but darkness, utter darkness, Matthew twenty five thirty. For they must have an everlasting light, since nothing can be there which is in any measure comfortable or refreshing. Number three. 
Our fire cannot affect a spirit but by way of sympathy with a body to which it is united. But hail fire will not only pierce into the bodies but directly into the souls of the damned. For it is prepared for the devil and his angels, those wicked spirits whom no fire on earth can hurt. Job complains heavily under the chastisement of God's fatherly hand, saying, The arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. Job 6 verse 4 But how will the spirits of the damned be pierced with the arrows of revenging justice? How will they be drunk up with the poison of the curse of these arrows? How vehement must that fire be which pierces directly into the soul and makes an everlasting burning in the spirit? the most lively and tender part of a man in which wounds or pains are most intolerable. Number four. The preparation of this fire proves the inexpressible vehemency and dreadfulness of it. The text calls it prepared fire, yea, the prepared fire by way of eminence. As the three children were not cast into ordinary fire, but a fire prepared for a particular purpose, which therefore was exceeding hot, the furnace being heated seven times more than ordinary, Daniel 3, verses 19 and 22. So the damned shall find in hell a prepared fire, the light to which was never prepared by human art. It is a fire of God's own preparing, a product of infinite wisdom, and with a particular purpose to demonstrate the most strict and severe divine justice against sin, which may sufficiently evidence to us the inconceivable exquisiteness thereof. God always acts in a peculiar way, becoming his infinite greatness, whether for or against a creature, therefore, as the things he has prepared for them that love him, are great and good beyond expression or conception. So one may conclude that the things he has prepared against those who hate him are great and terrible beyond what men can either say or think of them. The pile of Tophet is fire and much wood. The coals of that fire are coals of juniper, a kind of wood which set on fire burns most fiercely, Psalm 120, verse 4. And the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it, Isaiah 30, 33. Fire is more or less violent according to the manner of it and the breath by which it is blown. What heart then can fully conceive the horror of coals of juniper blown up with the breath of the Lord? Nay, God himself will be a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4, verse 24, to the damned, intimately present as the devouring fire in the souls and bodies. It is a fearful thing to fall into a fire, or to be shut up in a fiery furnace on earth. But the terror of these vanishes when we consider how fearful it is to fall into the hands of the living God, which is a lot of the damned. For who shall dwell with devouring fire? Who shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Isaiah thirty-three fourteen. As to the second point proposed, namely the properties of the fiery torments in hell. Number one, they will be universal torments, every part of the creature being tormented in that flame. When one is cast into a fiery furnace, the fire makes its way into the very heart and leaves no member untouched. What part then can have ease when the damned swim in a lake of fire burning with brimstone? There will their bodies be tormented and scorched forever. And as they sin, so they shall be tormented in all the parts thereof, that they shall have no sound side to turn them to. For what soundness or ease can be to any part of that body which being separated from God and all refreshments from him is still in the pangs of the second death, ever dying but never dead. But as the soul was chief in sinning, it will be chief in suffering too, being filled quite full of the wrath of a sin avenging God. The damned shall be ever under the deepest impressions of God's vindictive justice against him and this fire will melt their souls within them, like wax. Who knows the power of that wrath which had such an effect on the mediator standing in the room of sinners, Psalm twenty-two, fourteen. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. Their minds shall be filled with the terrible apprehensions of God's implacable wrath. Whatever they can think upon, past, present, or to come, will aggravate their torment and anguish. Their will shall be crossed in all things forevermore, as their will was ever contrary to the will of God's precepts. 
So God in his dealings with them in the other world shall have war with their will forever. What they would have they shall not in the least obtain, but what they would not shall be bound upon them without remedy. Hence no pleasant affection shall ever spring up in their hearts any more. Their love of complacency, joy, and delight and any object whatever shall be plucked up by the root, and they will be filled with hatred, fury, and rage against God themselves and their fellow creatures, whether happy in heaven or miserable in hell as they themselves are. They will be sunk in sorrow, racked with anxiety, filled with horror, galled to the heart with fretting, and continually darted with despair which will make them weep, gnash their teeth, and blaspheme forever. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into utter darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty-two thirteen. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great, Revelation 16.21. Conscience will be a worm to gnaw and prey upon them. Remorse for their sins shall seize them and torment them forever. And they shall not be able to shake it off as once they did, for in hell their worm dieth not. Mark 9.44 and 46. Their memory will serve but to aggravate their torment, and every new reflection will bring another pang of anguish. Luke 16.25 But Abraham said to the rich man in hell, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Number two. The torments in hell are manifold. But the case that a man were at one and the same time under the violence of the gout, gravel and whatever diseases and pains have ever met together in one body the torment of such a one would be but light in comparison of the torments of the damned for as in hell there is an absence of all that is good and desirable though there is a confluence of all evils there since all the effects of sin and of the curse take their place in it after the last judgment revelation 20 verse 14 and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire there they will find a prison that can never escape out of. A lake of fire where they will be forever swimming and burning. A pit whereof they will never find a bottom. The worm that dieth not shall feed on them as on bodies which are interred. The fire that is not quenched shall devour them as dead bodies which are burned. Their eyes shall be kept in blackness of darkness without the least comfortable gleam of light. Their ears filled with frightful yellings of the infernal crew. They shall taste nothing but the sharpness of God's wrath. The dregs of the cup of his fury. The stench of the burning lake of brimstone will be the smell there. And they shall feel extreme pains forevermore. Number three. They will be most exquisite and vehement torments, causing weeping, welling, and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, 42, and Matthew 22, 13. They are represented to us under the notion of pangs and travail, which are very sharp and exquisite. So says the rich man in hell, Luke 16, 24, I am tormented. To wit is one in the pangs of childbearing in this flame. Ah, dreadful pangs, horrible travail, in which both soul and body are in pangs together. Helpless travail, hopeless and endless. The word used for hell in Matthew 5, verse 22, and in a number of other places of the New Testament, properly denotes the valley of Hinnom, the name being taken from the valley of the children of Hinnom, in which was Tophet, 2 Kings 23:10, where idolaters offered their children to Moloch. This is said to have been a great brazen idol with arms like a man's, which being heated by fire within it. The child was set in the burning arms of the idol, and that the parent might not bear the shrieks of the child burning to death. They beat drums in the time of the horrible sacrifice, whence the place had the name of Tophet. Thus the exquisiteness of the torments in hell are pointed out to us. Some have endured grievous tortures on earth with surprising obstinacy and undaunted courage. But men's courage will fail them there when they find themselves fallen into the hands of the living God 
and no escape to be expected forever, it is true there will be degrees of torments in hell. It shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon than for Chorazin and Bethsaida, Matthew 11:21 and 22. But the least load of wrath there will be unsupportable, for how can the heart of the creature endure or his hands be strong when God himself is a consuming fire to him? When the tears are bound in bundles for the fire, there will be bundles of covetous persons, of drunkards, profane swearers, unclean persons, formal hypocrites, unbelievers, and despisers of the gospel, and the like, the several bundles being cast into hell fire. Some will burn more vehemently than others, according as their sins have been more heinous than those of others. A fiercer flame shall seize the bundle of the profane and the bundle of unsanctified moralists. The furnace will be hotter to those who have sinned against light than to those who have lived in darkness. Luke 22, 47 and 48. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. But the sentence common to them all, Matthew 13:30, bind them in bundles to burn them, speaks a great vehemency and exquisiteness of the lowest decree of torment in hell. Number four, there will be uninterrupted. There is no intermission there, no ease, no, not for a moment. They shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 10. Few are so tossed in this world, but sometimes they get rest, but the damned shall get none. They took their rest in the time appointed of God for their labor. Storms are rarely seen without some space between showers, but there is no intermission in the storm that falls on the wicked in hell. Their deep will be calling unto deep, and the waves of wrath continually rolling over them. There the heavens will be always black to them, and they shall have a perpetual night but no rest. Revelation 14, verse 11. They have no rest day nor night. Number five. They will be unpitied. The punishments inflicted on the greatest malefactors on earth draw forth some compassion from the spectators, but the damned shall have none to pity them. God will not pity them, but laugh at their calamity. Proverbs 1.26 The blessed company in heaven shall rejoice in the execution of God's righteous judgment and sing while the smoke rises up forever and ever. Revelation 19 verse 3 And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. No compassion can be expected from the devil and his angels who delight in the ruin of the children of men and are and will be forever void of pity. Neither will one pity another there, where every one is weeping and gnashing his teeth, under his own insupportable anguish and pain. Their natural affection will be extinguished. Parents will not love their children, nor children their parents. The mother will not pity the daughter in these flames, nor will the daughter pity the mother. The son will show no regard to his father there, nor the servant to his master where everyone will be groaning under his own torment. Number six, to complete their misery, their torment shall be eternal, Revelation 14.11. And the smoke of their torments ascendeth up forever and ever. Oh, what a frightful case is this, to be tormented in the whole body and soul, and that not with one kind of torment, but many. All of these most exquisite, and all this without any intermission, and without pity from any. What heart can conceive those things without horror? Nevertheless, if this most miserable case were at length to have an end, that would afford some comfort, but the torments of the damned will have no end, of which more afterwards application. Learn from this, number one, the evil of sin. It is a stream that will carry down the sinner till he be swallowed up in the ocean of wrath. The pleasures of sin are bought too dear at the rate of everlasting burnings. What availed the rich man's purple clothing and sumptuous fare when in hell he was encircled by purple flames and could not have a drop of water to cool his tongue? Alas, that men should indulge themselves in sin, which will be such bitterness in the end, that they should drink so greedily of the poisonous cup and hug that serpent in their bosom that will sting them to the heart. Number two. What a God he is with whom we have to do, what hatred he bears to sin, and how severely he punishes it. 
Know the Lord to be most just as well as most merciful, and think not that he is such a one as you are, away with the fatal mistake, ere it be too late. Psalms 50 verses 21 and 22 Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. The fire prepared for the devil and his angels, as dark as it is, will discover God to be a severe revenger of sin. Number three. The absolute necessity of fleeing to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. The same necessity of repentance and holiness of heart and life. The avenger of blood is pursuing thee, O sinner. Haste and escape to the city of refuge. Wash now in the fountain of the mediator's blood that you may not perish in the lake of fire. Open thy heart to him lest a pit close its mouth on thee. Leave thy sins, else they will ruin thee. Kill them, else they will be thy death forever. Let not the terror of hell fire put thee upon hardening thy heart more as it may do if you entertain that wicked thought there is no hope. Jeremiah 2.25 which perhaps is more common among the hearers of the gospel than many are aware of. But there is hope for the worst of sinners who will come to Jesus Christ. If there are no good qualifications in you, as certainly there can be none in a natural man, none in any man, but what are received from Christ, know that he has not suspended your welcome on any good qualifications. Do thou take him in his salvation freely offered unto all to whom the gospel comes. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 17. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37. It is true, thou art a sinful creature and canst not repent. Thou art unholy and canst not make thyself holy. Nay, thou hast attempted to repent, to forsake sin, and to be holy. But still failed of repentance, reformation, and holiness, and therefore thou sayest there is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. Truly no wonder that the success has not answered thy expectation, since thou hast always begun thy work amiss. But do thou first of all honor God by believing the testimony he has given of his Son, namely that eternal life is in him, and honor the Son of God by believing in him, that is, embracing and falling in with the free offer of Christ and of his salvation from sin and of wrath made to you in the gospel, trusting in him confidently for righteousness to your justification, and also for sanctification, seeing of God he has made unto us both righteousness and sanctification, 1 Corinthians one thirty. Then if you have as much credit to give to the word of God as you would allow to the word of an honest man, offering you a gift and saying, Take it, and it is yours, you may believe that God is your God, Christ is yours, his salvation is yours, your sins are pardoned. You have strengthened him for repentance and for holiness. For all these are made over to you in the free offer of the gospel. Believing of on the Son of God, you are justified. The curse is removed. And while it lies upon you, how is it possible you should bring forth the fruits of holiness? But the curse removed, that death which seized on you with the first Adam according to the threatening, is taken away. Genesis 2.17 in consequence of which you shall find the bands of wickedness now holding you fast and impenitence broken asunder as the bands of that death, so as you will be able to repent indeed from the heart. You shall find the spirit of life return to your soul on whose departure that death ensued, so as henceforth you shall be enabled to live unto righteousness. No man's case is so bad, but it may be mended this way in time to be perfectly right in eternity. And no man's case is so good, but another way being taken, it will be ruined for time and eternity too. The end of the first two sections of The State of the Damned by Thomas Boston Narrated by Thomas Sullivan